All right, we're going to look at our study today in the word of God. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 17. We're going to start at the beginning of the scriptures, uh, particularly with God's covenant with Abraham. And I want to make clear that what God is doing with Abraham is he's, he's beginning to establish an earthly kingdom through Abraham and his seed. And, 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 and where I want to go to the end, we're going to go from Genesis to Revelation. What happened to that kingdom? And I'm going to show you that when God made a promise to Abraham, he really intended on giving Abraham and his seed an earthly kingdom. Okay? He has inherited the earth. But the question is, then what happened to it? Why hasn't that been fulfilled? We're going to see that it hasn't yet, but we're going to see if God's going to keep his promises. And as you know, God is a God who keeps his promises. When Paul says in Romans 11:29, for the gifts and calling to God without repentance, when he gives you a gift, he doesn't change his mind. When he gives you a calling, he doesn't change his mind. So we're thankful. Uh, before we have a word of prayer, look at me with Genesis chapter number 17 and verse 1. Genesis 17, verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations, <coughs> For an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Verse 8. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee and their generations. Verse 10. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep. Between me and you and thy seed after thee, every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these holy words from your holy scriptures. Father, we thank you for this word of truth that you've spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Father, as we look into your holy word, as we, as we explore and dig in from Genesis to Revelation about this issue of this kingdom, please give us great insight, understanding, and wisdom, Father. Please open up the eyes of our understanding so that those who may have questions about these, which I receive a lot over, over the days, uh, folks who, who want to have greater understanding of what you're doing in this earth in prophecy. So, Father, we ask that you open up the eyes of our understanding, open up these scriptures to us by your Holy Spirit and your Holy Word. And Father, most importantly, we just thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his sacrifice on Calvary's cross, his shed blood for our sins, and how that we can have everlasting life as a free gift today under grace by faith alone in Christ alone, no works. Father, we just thank you for this Holy Word. Um, we're, we're, we're just so thankful that we can even come to you in prayer because of what the, the Lord Jesus Christ did. So as we look into this holy word, give us great insight, understanding, and wisdom, and most importantly, a greater appreciation of your son, our savior, the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his wonderful name we pray, amen. amen. Here in, in Genesis chapter 17, uh, look with me again uh, at, at Genesis chapter number 17, and what I want you to see, I'm gonna write some things on the board mm -hmm. here, and, 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 and we're gonna see we're going to see the beginning of this kingdom program. When I say the beginning of the, of the uh, re reclaiming the kingdom, obviously the kingdom program began with Adam. But when Adam and his wife Eve sinned against God in disobedience to the word of God, uh, God had to postpone that kingdom program. He had to put it on hold for a while. What I mean on hold is he had to do some other things, deal with sin. But when you come to Abraham, God is now working his plan to reclaim the earth to himself through Abraham's seed. And what I want you to see in chapter 17, look at verse 1. It says, and when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abram, appeared to Abram and said unto him, 
I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Notice the first thing here I want to put on the board is who God is dealing with. He later calls him Abraham. He's Abram, but he calls him Abraham down later in the chapter, a father of many nations. OK, so it, it has to do with Abraham and eventually his seed. All right. So when it comes to the kingdom program in your Bible, the focus is this man, Abraham and his seed. Uh, another thing I want you to see. Look at verse number four. Genesis 17, 4, as for me, the Lord says, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shall be a father of many nations. He already changed his name to Abraham, as you can see in the chapter. And notice God makes a covenant with him. And this covenant or this contract God makes is between Abraham and his seed. He makes a covenant. Hey, Mark, good to see you. There's Larry, too. He makes a covenant. We're in Genesis chapter number 17. So God makes this covenant. The next thing I want you to see is what happens down in verse number six. Hello, Rosie and Larry. Uh, Genesis 17, verse six. He says, and I will make thee. Now, remember, I put Abraham up here because he's saying thee and thou. Like Abraham's the, the, the key here. He's saying thee and thou, okay? Verse number six. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful. And I will make nations of thee. Now, the focus I want you to see in verse 6 is, and kings shall come out of thee. So the next thing we're going to see when it comes, the whole reason about this kingdom is because kings will come out of Abraham. Kings. Okay? <clears throat> uh, why, I'm, why, I'm, why I'm there, because Abraham has a wife named Sarah, God's going to say the same to her. Go down to verse 15 and 16. Genesis 17, verse 15 and 16. And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, that's her name before Sarah. Well, it's right in the verse. Here we go. And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall, shall her name be. Verse 16. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. That's Isaac. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. So she's part of that covenant, too, but with the kings. Okay? Uh, go back, if you will, to verse number 8. Verse 7 and 8. Sorry about that. Genesis 17, 7 and 8. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee and their generations. But here's the, here's the focus about this kingdom. For an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Verse 8. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land. Now, in verse 7, notice this covenant is not temporary. Because sometimes this, this issue of replacement theology or that the body of Christ is spiritual Israel, it's not something that's in Scripture. Because notice, this covenant is everlasting. Okay? And that's the next thing that folks conveniently forget is, I will give thee the what? The land. There's land, the land of Canaan and so forth. There's land associated with this promise. All right? Uh, that's verse number Seven, eight, look at verse 8, and I will give unto thee and to, and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. All, notice that word all, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession I will be, and I will be their God. So I want you to see these things. It's to Abraham, thou, and his seed after him. It's a covenant or contract God makes with them. It's, this is a binding thing between God and Abraham. By the way, later he's going he's gonna to make it bound with, uh, with uh, 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 a sacrifice. God says there are going to be kings that come out of you and your wife. The covenant is everlasting. It'll never end. It, it pertains giving them all the land God promised them, what, what we now know in that, that, that region in the Middle East, particularly the Arabian Peninsula and so forth. And, and, and one more thing I want you to see, verse number 9 and 10. And God said unto Abram, Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee and their generations. Here it is. What's the covenant? This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be what? Saved. 
circumcised. So that issue of circumcision, okay, that issue of circumcision is key. And what God did as a seal of the faith that Abraham has, Paul says in Romans 4, was give him this circumcision where the, you cut the foreskin of the male children. That's a type of uh, cutting off of the flesh. Not what you can produce, but what God produced through you. That's what the covenant is. And these are important because when we talk about the gospel of the kingdom, the apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 2, that's why you, have to, you need the right Bible. God wants you to have that King James Bible. All the other Bibles change that, what Paul says, the gospel of the circumcision unto Peter and the gospel of the uncircumcision unto him. Galatians 2, the gospel, not to the circumcision, the gospel of the circumcision. It's a genitive in the Greek. That's right. Up to. Right. And the reason that's that is because it's associated with the kingdom gospel, the earthly kingdom. And God and Paul want you to know in the body of Christ that that's not what God's doing today. So he'll say the gospel of the uncircumcision or the gospel of grace to the Gentile. Right hey, in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, Wherefore remember that ye being time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called the what? Uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. And what God is doing, he's making a division between Abraham's physical seed for the earthly kingdom and what God's going to do through the body of Christ. But we're not there yet. I just want you to see these, these things here. Now, on our way, go to Genesis chapter 35. God, God says, I'm going to establish this with your seed and their generations. And that next seed would be Isaac and Jacob. Notice what he says to Jacob. God, God is reminding Israel. By the way, this is when he, called, he changed his name to Israel. In Genesis chapter 35, it's a sad occasion for Jacob because his wife dies. Rachel dies down in verse number uh, 18. Look at Genesis 35, 18. Genesis 35, 16. Genesis 35, 16. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had a hard labor. She had a hard labor. Now, Rachel is a type of Israel, of the nation of Israel in the future. And when she travails, it's a type of that, that tribulation period, like a woman travail having birth. She's going to bring forth Benjamin, the most cherished tribe in Israel. That's why Paul says, uh, 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 of the tribe of Benjamin, because that was his child, that, that Jacob's child by his beloved Rachel, his, his, his last bastion of her. He had, she had Joseph and Benjamin. And you remember when Joseph went to Egypt and, and when he, he, was, he was hid from his brothers, he says, where's your other brother? You got another one. They said, please don't let us bring him because our father would die. He's he, like, he was special. Joseph was special, but he was gone. They, they, his father thought he was dead. He was in Egypt. But Benjamin was the last bastion of Rachel, his beloved, right? She ended up dying, notice in verse 17. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And just like in Revelation, this woman has this man child. She's going to die, the old Israel nation. And God's going to bring forth... This Benjamin represents that little flock that comes out of Egypt, the one who inherits the land. It's, just, it's a lot of symbolism here. Verse, eight, verse 18. And it came to pass as her soul, we were talking about that female, her soul was in departing. Notice the process of death. Just like there's a process of birth. Interesting, you see the process of birthing, labor, umbilical cord, and then there's a process of your soul leaving, death. Solomon says that silver cord is broken. And until that's broken, that umbilical cord of death, that's why people can see themselves being worked on, near-death experience. They can see the people working on them because their soul's departing, but it goes back in. Or drowning victims and so forth, they can see it happening. And just the way you come in through a process, you go out in a process as well. Now notice here, verse 18, and it came to pass as her soul was in departing, 
You know, that's why Paul says the time of my departure is at hand. He understood the process of death. And it came to pass as her soul was in the party, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. And, and that name Benjamin means the son of my right hand, the son of my strength. And he's a type of that little flock that's going to inherit the kingdom. But I want you to see that even though this sad thing happened, he lost his beloved. God had promised him something earlier in the chapter. Look at verse number nine. God changed his name to Israel. Watch this. Verse nine. And God appeared unto Jacob again. And when he uh, when he came out of Paddan Aram and blessed him and God said unto him, thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name what? And the moment that means that means the princes of God, princes of God or prince having favor with God. Now watch. Look at the next verse. Verse 11. And God said unto him, I am God almighty. Be fruitful and multiply a nation and a company of nations shall be of thee. And what? Kings shall come out of thy loins. God reiterates this same covenant with Abraham's grandson. He did it with Isaac too, but I want you to see Jacob because Jacob is who, 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 where we get Israel. He, he, he's the man who God named Israel. And when we talk about Israel in the Bible, it comes from this man and God made this covenant promise again with him. Now let's work our way through. Go over to Exodus. See, we're going to go right on through the Revelation. Exodus chapter 19. Hundreds of years later, the nation of Israel has multiplied in Egypt. They went into Egypt 70 plus souls to Joseph, their brother, and they multiplied over 400 years. God promised Abraham in Genesis. He says, you're going to be there for 400 years, four generations. And God did that so they might multiply. Pharaoh knew it at the end. He says, wait a minute. I'm looking. They got more people than we got. And if our enemies come... They can get them to conspire against us and defeat us. So he tried to put them down. But the Bible says the more he gave them hard bondage, the more they multiplied. God was with them. But notice, in it, now they're out. They're, they're, they've come through the Red Sea. The Egyptian, Pharaoh and his army has been destroyed in the Red Sea. And God congealed, the, froze those waters, but he sent that warm wind and it flooded them out. Now they're on the other side. And what did God promise them? Look at, Genesis, look at Exodus 19. You think God forgot about his promise, even though it's been 400 years? No. Exodus 19, verse number 5. Start at verse 4, Exodus 19, 4. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. They saw the Egyptians bobbing and weaving in the waters drowned. Verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar what? Treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now, here's what I want everybody to see. And ye shall be a kingdom of what? A kingdom of priests. And what else? A holy nation. A holy nation. That's the nation of Israel. They're holy, but notice they're a kingdom of priests. If they have a, if they have a kingdom, that means they have kings. And they're priests because they're going to they're gonna represent the Gentiles before Almighty God in that kingdom. And they're a holy nation. They're set apart unto God. God didn't forget. How about 2 Samuel? Go over to 2 Samuel, if you will. Now you're in the time of David, King David. Oh, King David, 2 Samuel, if you will. And God made a promise, 2 Samuel chapter 7. God made a promise to Abraham that it would be his seed. So Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had the 12 patriarchs. And one of those 12 patriarchs was named Judah. And out of the line of Judah, we have King David. And notice, because David had a... He was a man who had a heart after God. He wasn't perfect. He committed an unpardonable sin in that day, which was adultery with Uriah the Hittite's wife. And murder, conspirators commit murder, but he, he's, the, he's the king. He says, put him on the front lines, let him die. The, the, uh, Uriah, he committed murder. And so 
Although he wasn't perfect, yea, he deserved death, God had mercy on him. You remember Gen uh, Exodus 33, God says, no matter what the dispensation, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I will com have compassion. God does things decent and in order, but at, at, at his royal decree, he could say, I have mercy on you, and it happens. That's what God, we, we did a study on that, the Exodus 33 principle. David was that way. Under the law, David was to be stoned to death for murder and for adultery. But God didn't kill him. He judged him, but he didn't kill him. He didn't send him to hell. He didn't take his Holy Spirit away from David as he did with Saul before him. But That's right. Watch what, because David had a heart after God. Notice David wasn't perfect. God's not looking for your perfection. He's looking for you to have the right heart's humility before him, contrition. David said, that is encouraging. Religion makes it think like you have to be this perfect person before God. And you're messing up, Dodie, and God's going to get you. That's not how God does things. He gives you space to repent. He wants that, what, Psalm 51, he says, a broken and contrite spirit thou will not, you know, push away. David was worthy of death, but his heart was right in humility before Almighty God. Against thee, against thee only have I sinned. That works with God. Humbleness and humility, contrite spirit. And because of David's heart toward God, he was the promised king. It would be through his seed that God would bring what we would now know from Scripture is the Messiah, the son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Samuel chapter number 7. And uh, look with me, if you will, at verse number 10. 2 Samuel 7, verse 10. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. Now, here's, here's what I want you guys to see. It's Abraham's seed. Let me show you here. It's Israel. Now, when he says, I appoint a place, that's the land. That's the place. Because the, 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 the replacement the theology folks or the spiritual Israel folks, they never talk about the land. They never talk about the place that God will plant them. Let's look at that verse. Verse, verse 10, more I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them. He, that's the vineyard the Lord speaks about in the Gospels. He, the man planted a vineyard. Those trees in the book of Judges, it's one of them is a vine tree. There's the bramble, the vine, the fig tree. I'm missing one. There's the fig tree, the bramble, and what was the other one? Uh, fig tree, vine, mm -hmm. bramble. I got my verses on my you, 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 there were four trees, right? The olive tree, thank you, Lord. The olive tree. The spiritual uh, life of Israel, the religious life there, the national, and that's them in their bramble, that's them that sticky stuff were in their rebellion, yes. And those are the four trees. This is in the book of Judges. This is uh, the, the oil of olive represents spiritual. This, the fig tree, that's the religious life of Israel, religious. All the way back to the garden. Yep, that goes back to the garden, the fig, fig leaf. The vine tree means the national life of Israel, them as a nation. And this is them and their rebellion. Okay. But I just want you to see that. And what God's going to do is plant them. That's why the Lord always uses, he says, this man sows, he plants a vineyard and so forth. The rebellion one goes back to Genesis 2 with the thorns. And exactly, and thorns and thistles. Shall bring. That's right. That's right, Ryan. You got that right. When Adam sinned, right, God mm -hmm. says, thorns and thistles shall it bring to you. In, Gen in, in, in uh, 2 Samuel 7, verse 10, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. <laughs> They're there forever. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them anymore as before time. That's not happening today. I'm just looking at over, over uh, just, just, just uh, this past weekend, all this stuff happened at the Gaza Strip. President Trump says, yeah, the Golan Heights. This week, last week he said the Golan Heights, where Syria used to occupy, looks over the, 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 the Mediterranean there, not the Mediterranean, um, is the Mediterranean? The Sea of Galilee, sorry about that. The Golan Heights, mentioned in the Bible. God promised the Golan Heights to I believe the, the tribe of Manasseh, but they were to take the Golan Heights and give it over to the priest, because the priest didn't have an inheritance, the Levites, as a city of refuge. 
so that the slayer, the manslayer, could go and as a city of refuge. So the Golan Heights, that is that what they're fighting over right now, that was in the hands of Syria, looks over the Sea of Galilee there. That's Israel's too, the tribe of Manasseh, and they gave it as a suburb to the, to the priests, the Levites, as a city of refuge. That's what the Bible says. Mount Hermon's there too, right? Mount Hermon is there too, right? Boom. And that's significant. We could, maybe we're going to do just a study on Mount Hermon. That's interesting. That's probably the, 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 the Mount of Transfiguration that the Lord was on when he was transfigured before Peter, James, and John, and Moses and Elijah. That was Mount Hermon. Interesting area right there. But just this week, that Golan Heights. So it's significant that Israel has it because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stronghold where when Syria had it, they could bomb down there. Now that Israel has it, they can watch out and they have peace. There's a lot of things in the Bible about that. Even before, a year or so ago, he, he, he officially announced, proclaimed that we, our nation, acknowledge that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. All that stuff is setting the stage for the entire. But right here, notice, they're not going to be afflicted. Verse 11, and as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, I have caused thee to rest from the, all thine enemies, as the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee in house. And we were talking about that house. We were talking about that in the Q&A. But David and Solomon, for their 40 years and 40 years of reign, 80 total years of reign, they had, peace. they had peace in Israel. At no other time did Israel ever have that type of peace than when David reigned and Solomon reigned. And God was showing Israel what kingdom can be like, where God is your God and your enemies don't move a muscle. It, the Bible say not a hair on their head would drop, you know, without them being afraid. I love the terminology. He says they won't even move a little finger towards Israel. They were frightened of Israel for good reason because God was with Israel. Amen. Notice. Still is. Well, you know what? During the dispensation of grace, it's different, but I, I want to when we talk about prophecy, though, Dodi, God hasn't changed his mind about how he sees them, right? He put the kingdom on hold. We're going to see that, but, but hold on to that thought. Verse number 12. We're talking about in prophecy right now, not the dispensation of grace. Ver right. Verse 12. Okay. And when thy days be fulfilled, he says to David, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his what? Kingdom. Now, God says he's going to establish a kingdom. He's going to establish a kingdom. Verse number 13. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish. I love that. I will establish. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's done. It's the end result. Think about the word establish in the one before. That's more the process. Establish means it's done and settled. You can even see it in the two verses. Verse number, yeah, he used establish, then he used establish. There you go. You got it, Matthew. One is the process. One is the end result. Verse 13. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? Forever. Amen. Forever. I always ask the question, when someone says, Brother Ron, how do you know something that was in the Old Testament is different now under the New Testament or under grace? I said, Paul would say it first. So he'll just tell you, I understand that there are no unclean meats today. Paul says it. And if he doesn't say it changed, God changed it, it hadn't changed. We talk a lot about what feminism has brought into this world. There's a lot of things that our, 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 our culture in the West here particularly got all upside down and backwards, man. Because the question is, when did God change that? We, in our, in our Q&A down in Southern California, they were talking about women preachers. I said, no. Mm -mm. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. Paul said that. Paul said it. But then I'll go into the Old Testament and show the, the relationship between men and women, how the, the man is the head of the woman, is the man, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. And I still say, oh, Joyce Myers could do it, because they say, see, that was back then. And you know, my question is, when did it change? <laughs> and if it did change, show me in the Bible, because Paul didn't. It didn't change. The world changed it, but God didn't. That's how you know what, what, what the principles come over to the dispensation of grace. 
Watch this. Because even this kingdom, even this kingdom, something changed. God changed something. We're going to see what, why and, and what happened. But if God didn't change it, if, the, if, if God the Father didn't change it, it would be here. And, and, and the reason he changed it, we're going to look at, and when that's done, it's coming. God didn't change his mind about this earthly kingdom is my point. Replacement theologists who think that church has replaced Israel. No way. No way. Or, or um, what they call that, spiritual Israel and all this nonsense. Mm -hmm. God didn't change his mind. God the Father changed something temporarily, but he didn't change his mind about this. He's serious about it. Let's look at it. He blinded them. Yeah. Verse 13. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. God didn't change his mind about that. Verse 14. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, that's the Gentile heathens, and will with the stripes of the children of men. Verse 15, but, but my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee, David. Verse 16, and thine house, David's house, and thy kingdom, David's kingdom shall be established, how long? Forever before me, thee. Thy throne shall be established for how long? Forever. Is that not clear? You, these replacement theologists and these spiritual Israel people, what does this stuff mean? When did God stop that? We have the answer for why it hasn't come, but they don't. They don't rightly divide. They don't recognize the Pauline dispensation of grace change. And if you don't recognize the dispensation of grace, you're calling God a liar. When did it change? Hold on. On our way. Daniel and then the book of Luke. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2. We're working our way forward. Daniel chapter 2. I'm just putting this out there so if, some, if someone can share this video with someone who's a replacement theologist. If you're a replacement theologist or you are one of these spiritual Israel folk, I challenge you, listen to this video. And then I will invite you to come on to our place and we will record. I, I, will, I will invite you to poke holes in it in front of everybody and we put that out. That's all I ask. You listen to these, this, this, this video with the verses and then I'll invite you on because I, I, I love to have folks give me their opposition and opinion. Let's do it. Go over to Daniel. Daniel chapter number, what did I tell you? Daniel 2, look at verse 44. I'm just like a lawyer. I'm just going right through the evidence from Scripture. Boom, 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 boom. We're going right to, through the revelation. Look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Daniel has this prophecy about all the kingdoms and kings of all the, the, the nations throughout time. Here we go. Verse 44, Daniel 2, 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven... Set up a what? Amen. I went over that two weeks ago. The kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven only mentioned in Matthew because it's the God of heaven. And it's going to be the days of heaven on earth, Moses says in Deuteronomy. Here we go. Verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Now, what, what type of kingdom? A temporary kingdom? No. Which shall never be what? Destroyed. But wait, there's more. Didn't God promise Israel in Exodus 19, they will be a what? Kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Here's the rest of it. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, means Gentiles, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand just for a little while. Well, if you're a replacement theology, Israel, God's done with them, he's dealt with us. If you're spiritual Israelist, God's done with them, he's no, 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 no. This says it shall stand how long? <coughs> Forever. Luke chapter 1. How about the New Testament when it comes to the Lord's earthly ministry? Go over to Luke chapter 1. Did God forget over those hundreds of years from the time he made the promise with David and then prophesied through Daniel? Maybe he forgot. Maybe that 400 years of drought that we saw a couple weeks ago where God didn't speak to them according to Amos. Maybe God forgot over 400 years. There's the stupidest show on TV, but I can't help. I got to look at it sometimes. Krista can't even watch it because they make fun of it. It's called 
What's the name of that stupid show where they make, they make God an idiot? Moves on. Moves on. Where the angels, the guy from Harry Potter. And, uh, what's the name of it? I forgot. Anyway, it's stupid. They got God being a buffoon. And his angels are helping. It's, it's ridiculous. It doesn't matter. And a black guy face. What's it called? Crystal, you slipping. Yeah, you slipping. <laughs> <laughs> she was. I put out of my. I huh? Watch the black guy? No. It's an Indian guy. Black radio. Who's that crazy comedian who plays yeah. God with the long hair? Crazy bug-eyed comedian. He's funny. Anyway, it's a stupid show. <laughs> and Krista can't even look at, she can't even look at the, the, the uh, what they call the uh, pre previews, because they got, they got God, God being a buff, such a buffoon, right? Miracle workers. Oh, yeah. Miracle workers. <laughs> oh, well, that's a different one. But this was called, anyway, the premise of this is God, he forgets stuff. They have to remind him and stuff. God don't forget nothing, and no angels have to remind him of anything. This premise is he's going to destroy the earth, and these <coughs> angels come up. They, they, they're, they're working miracles because God says, oh, I'm not doing any more miracles. So they, he may lets the angels do it. If y'all can get it, we won't blow up the earth. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. God doesn't need to be reminded when time passed by. So from the promises he made in the Old Testament, when you come to the book of Luke, this is hundreds of years later, okay? A couple of thousand of years past Abraham, you come to the Lord Jesus, right? Maybe God forgot about this kingdom. Well, look at Luke. You got Luke chapter 1? Look at Luke chapter 1. If God forgot about the kingdom, why would he send Gabriel? By the way, the same Gabriel he sent to Daniel. That angel who was talking to Daniel hundreds of years earlier is the same Gabriel, the messenger of God, the angel of God, who speaks to Mary and, uh, Mary and Joseph in a dream, but Mary... I want you to see what he says to Mary, verse 26. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Everybody got it? Luke 1, 26. And in the sixth month, this is six months after John the Baptist is conceived, Jesus' cousin. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named what? Nazareth. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, remember, you want to know why it's written that way? Because didn't we see in 2 Samuel, he says, because Ryan and Rick Craig and I, we've been talking about the man's house. He says, man, you've been dead for a while, but that's still your house. And the house of David is the one who was promised the kingdom. So God says, God still looks at it like it's David's. David's been gone a while. Check it out. Verse 27. To a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's <laughs> name was Mary. Isaiah prophesied, Behold, I give you a son. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God with us. That's the, this is the prophecy right here, fulfilled. Verse 28, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hell, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, Blessed art thou among women. You know the Catholics like that part right there. <laughs> Holy Mary, Mother of God, and all this stuff. Pray for us sinners now. That's crazy. She's blessed, but she's not some co-redemptress or something. You don't pray to Mary. She says, my soul does magnify the Lord. She calls the Lord her Savior. And if he's your Savior, that means she's not sinless. <coughs> She is highly favored. She had a heart to believe God. All she said was, uh, I know not a man how this is going to happen. I've never been with a man. The angel says, the Holy Ghost is going to do it. She says, let it, be, let it be according to thy word. She believed. Notice, verse number, uh, let's, let's look at verse uh, 29. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutations this should be. I bet you would if an angel just appeared, huh? Verse 30, and the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name, what? Jesus. Man, this is, that's the greatest proclamation ever made on earth. <laughs> Imagine Mary, and here's an angel, the same angel who spoke to Daniel hundreds of years ago, said, you're going to conceive and call his name Jesus. 
for he shall save his people from their sins. Jehovah is salvation. That's what it says in another passage. Notice this. Verse number 32. He shall be great and he shall and, be, and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father who? David. That's that second Samuel covenant. But keep reading. Read the next part. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob for just a little while, forever. And of his kingdom, I just lasted for a little bit. No, there shall be no what? No, no end. end. No end. No. I'm just setting the case that what happened to this kingdom? Because all this stuff been promised in the scriptures. Let's keep going. The apostles believed him. I want to show you something. We're going to, we're going to go back to the Lord's earthly ministry in a moment. But the apostles believed the Lord Jesus Christ. You're in Luke. Go to Luke chapter 12. Go over to Luke chapter 12. That was baby Jesus. He wasn't even conceived yet, but now he's a grown man. Why did the Catholics keep him as a little baby? You know, put down Christ. Yeah, make him infantile and, and immature. But also, you know, that whole in the Old Testament when they when they pass their babies to, to Molech, it's called abortion today, but it's in, inside the womb. Well, some places now you can do it out after the baby's born, New York, Virginia. But I think that's another reason, too. He has this baby, and, and, and what Israel did in time past, Baal worship, was hand their children over to their god Molech and Baal. Maybe some symbolism that definitely having them on that cross all week and stuff. Ryan, would you say that's Satan taking a snapshot of his weakest moment, right? Mm -hmm. The weakest the Lord ever been. Satan just loves him. Snapshot. Then he's take that right there. He ain't on that cross no more, man. He died. He was buried. And he rose again victorious the third day. If you want to have the cross, fine. Pre Preach of the cross, but an empty cross because he's not on that cross all suffering no more. Uh-uh. He, he rose victorious the third day over sin and death. So Satan likes that weak, and he likes that little baby. He might as well just hand him over. Yeah, interesting. But notice here, he grew up, though. Look at Luke chapter 12, if you will. Luke chapter number 12, and go down to verse number 29. Luke chapter 12, verse 29. And seek not, he tells his apostles, it's just disciples, and seek not, uh, and seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye doubtful of mine. I see, I, I'm, I'm reading it out of my head. Neither be ye of doubtful mine. Verse 30. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. In another passage, he says the Gentiles. The Gentiles are the people of the nations, the territory. The, the Gentiles, the nations seek after that. Verse 30. And your father, talking about Israel, knoweth that ye have need of these things. Now here's what I want y'all to see, verse 31 and 32. But rather seek ye the kingdom of who? And uh, seek ye the kingdom of God, and another passage says, and his righteousness. Here it says, and all these things shall be added unto you. And why do we call them little flock? It's in this verse. Verse 32, fear not, our Lord calls them what? Little flock. For it is your father's Good pleasure to give you the what? Listen, God's good pleasure is to give them that kingdom. He's not playing around with this stuff. And then I love this part because now you ask somebody, are they a disciple of Jesus? They say, oh, yeah. Verse 33, sell that ye have, sell it. Our dear brother Joseph, I hope he comes today. He comes at the Q&A. First, first time he came, I was after a long time. I said, Joseph, you are, you're a disciple of Christ. Oh, yeah. Why don't you sell all you have? That's part of the program. God doesn't want me to sell my bike and my instrument. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. <laughs> were you here, Mark? You were here. Yeah, did he come back? Yeah, he come, he, he come back almost every week. Yeah. Oh, cool. All right. Just for a few minutes here and there, but yeah. I think he's intrigued with us. 
<laughs> sell, sell, verse 33, sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. Listen, he's telling them all your earthly goods and stuff, get rid of them. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about what you're going to eat that day, what you're going to drink that day, and earlier, how you're going to clothe yourself. God will do it. Consider the lilies of the field, how beautiful they are. They're not good for cats, I found out, but they're beautiful. <laughs> cats get sick and, and messed up with, with lilies. Dodie, you know that lily you gave Christmas mother? You know that lily? Beautiful lily? We had to get rid of it because cats get lethargic and they get sick just touching and they rub up against it. So it was beautiful, but we had to get rid of it. Yeah? Don't let, don't let your cats get next to lilies, yeah. Mess them up. A lot of people in our area were finding out we have a lot of feral cats and lilies are starting to sprout up. And these folks are finding these cats all weak and messed up. So some, some vet or something, some, some, somehow they found out in the spring these feral cats rub up against and eat these lilies and they're getting sick and stuff. So we got two cats we had to get rid of the lily. But consider the lilies, they're beautiful. Dodie gave, Dodie's got lilies growing right, right around her house there. Gave one to Diane, Christmas mother, beautiful. He says, God clothed them. Why are you worried about clothing? He says, consider the little birdies. They neither sow nor reap. They, you've never seen a bird planting seeds and warding seeds, do you? No. But God feeds them, he says. And he goes, if he feeds these little birds or these little flowers that are here today going tomorrow, every hair on your head is numbered by God. He's going to take care of you. That's what he's telling them. That's how inter interested God is in man. What is man that thou art mindful for him, David says, the son of man that thou visited him? Thou made him a little lower than the angels and crownest him with glory. David understood why God created man, to be kings, to reign with him, to reign. Watch this. He said, sell all you have. So now, do, do you think his disciples believed that he was going to give them a kingdom? Go over to the book of Acts. How about after his crucifixion? Well, surely, Brother Ron, it had to be over once they crucified the Lord. I mean, it had to be over, right? No. Didn't God, when they, when they rejected their Messiah, put them on a cruel and criminal Roman cross, let them old nasty, dirty, uncircumcised Gentiles touch their Messiah? They shouldn't even have touched him. They shouldn't even approach him. They don't have a right to talk to him. Surely God says, now you don't get no kingdom. Mm -hmm. Because after his resurrection... Notice in chapter 1 of Acts, I'm going to do understanding Acts. The reason I'm doing this study is you can't understand Acts without understanding the kingdom program. You can't. Because there's, there's something that changed with the kingdom program. But we got to see that it was real. Then you can understand Acts. We're going to go through passages in Acts. Mm -hmm. I get more questions about stuff that is done in the book of Acts than any other part of prophecy. It's, it's crazy. So we're going to go through them. But I said, as I was praying up and thinking about it, I have to explain that the kingdom was real first. Because if you don't understand that this kingdom was real, God didn't change his mind, and you're not spiritual Israel replacement Israel, you're not going to understand Acts. You, this, you need to know this. And most of the fools that I get don't understand this, therefore they don't understand Acts. And in pride, they'll say stuff, and I say, no, you have to be part of a local assembly of other brothers testing your theories out. When you don't, you, you can go through pride, dead reckoning down the road in the, in, in, in the waters, because you need other men to keep you sharp. But to understand Acts on any level, you have to understand this kingdom program and what, it's, what it entails. Look at Acts chapter 1. The Lord Jesus before his ascension. Verse 6. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. When they, this is the 11 apostles and the Lord, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at what? This time, what's that next word? Restore, what's the next word? Again, the kingdom to who? Israel. That's right, to Israel. The first question they asked him right in the book of Acts is, 
All right, Lord, you up now, man. You out of the grave. It's time. That, that's what they're saying. That's, the, that's my verse. That's, that's what they're saying. It's time. They tried to stop you, Lord. These Romans killed you. The people rejected you. You're, you're alive. Is it kingdom time? Hmm. Interesting. It wasn't time yet. But he had already told them it wasn't time yet. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Luke records. This is a sequel to the book of Luke. Luke records something in Luke chapter 19. Go back to Luke 19. He already showed them that the kingdom was going to be something that happened after something else. In Acts 1, don't get mad at them. They didn't have the Holy Ghost yet. We're going to see that after Acts 2, when they get the Holy Ghost, it makes sense to them because the Holy Ghost is giving them understanding. But the Lord spoke to them about this delay in the kingdom. In Acts 1, they say, Lord, is it time for the kingdom of the to again? Was God going to do it? He says, no, the Father got some other things, you know, pouring out the Holy Ghost and stuff. But wait a minute. He already warned them. Look at Luke chapter 19, verse 12. Luke chapter 19, verse 12. Start at verse 11. Everybody got it? Luke 19, verse 11. Now, I want you to look at the verse 11's question. Watch this. And as they heard these things, he, he added and spake a parable. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should what? Immediately appear. But what would give them that thought? Because they're on their way to Jerusalem. Do you know in their mind, they said, we got it now. Boy. He's going to get these Romans. We go. And they were going to Jerusalem. I think part of what happened to Judas was he was ready for the power and the prestige, boy. When he found out, no, I got to die first, he got offended. He held the bag. In his mind, being part of Jesus Christ's cabinet, his inner, his inner princess, he was one of the 12, he was going to have glory and power, but he didn't have the humility to deal with. He was a disgruntled. He was disgruntled, <laughs> and God was testing all of their hearts. When it says to Peter, Satan has, Satan went to God. He says, you see those 12 men right there? I'm going to sift them. Allow me to, he had to ask, allow me to sift them as wheat. The Lord told Peter, he says, Satan has desired to sift you, not just Peter, but you, the 12, as wheat. And I have prayed for you all that your faith fell at night. One man didn't pass the test, Judas. He wanted power, prestige. He held the bag. He wanted money. His greed and his idolatry, covetousness, which is idolatry, got him. Satan asked God, let me, let me work on him like I did with Job. Watch this. Look at uh, Luke, I'm sorry, Luke 19, what did I tell you? Oh, yeah, sorry, 12. Verse to, uh, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Luke 18. I was like, that ain't making no sense. Okay, verse number 11. Okay, and as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem. I want when you read that, understand, they're going to Jerusalem. They're thinking, it's time, baby. It's the kingdom time, baby. That's what they're thinking. And because they, well, here's right there. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. The 12 were thinking, it's on. Oh, yeah. It's on. They know the timetable. Listen. Hold, hold on. They knew the scripture. Hold, hold your hand right there. Don't, don't move there. Go, go back to Matthew chapter 3. Listen, this stuff is real. They were like, oh, yeah, we get it, Lord. We got it. Now, they didn't know the timing of things, but they knew what they were doing. Look, look at uh, Matthew 3, verse 1 and 2. Matthew 3, verse 1 and 2. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye. Well, why is he hollering repent to Israel? For the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. It's, at hand. it's right there. And they's like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's time. You know, when it says about Apollos in Acts, it says he, he only knew to the baptism of John. Do you know what all Apollos knew was the kingdom program? That's all he knew. 
He all he knew was that the kingdom was coming on earth. You know what he didn't know? What we're going to show at the end of this thing. Priscilla and Aquila was the one who taught Apollos the Jew that the kingdom program was put on hold and God is doing something different today. That the kingdom program on this earth was postponed, Apollos, for a season so God can do something else. That's what they showed him. When it says all he knew was to the baptism of John, that's it right here. Verse 2, and saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Go down to verse number 5. Matthew 3, 5, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. And what did they do? And were baptized of him, where? In Jordan, confessing their sin. It wasn't like the Catholics, you get in the box with the priest and tell them all your sin. No, no, no. It was the act of submitting to John's water baptism was the confessing of your sins. Can John sit and listen to a thousand plus people? Let me tell you what I did last night, brother John. <laughs> Boy, it was, rough. it was a wild one, man. John would still be baptizing people in the Jordan. No, it was the act of submitting to the water baptism, to that sprinkling he did, that was an Israeli confessing their sins. It was the act of the submission to the water baptism. They weren't verbally, every one of them said, John would have been like Moses. Remember back in, when Moses was listening to everybody's problems? I only get a little bit of that in ministry over 20 plus years. Moses was listening all day. His, his one of his wife's father said, hey, man, you can't do this. You're going to die, man. He says, get you 70 people. Let the big, Moses, you be the Supreme Court. Let them handle that little stuff. Dude, it says that Moses would listen to people's stuff all day, every day. Can you imagine? I can't. I understand. I only know it on a small scale. He would have died from that. The guy said, he, God says, that's good. Listen to him. And that's where the 70 elders came from, by the way. Okay, that, That's the tradition, because Moses was listening all day. John couldn't do that, is my point. Apollos knew the baptism of John. He knew this kingdom program, but something changed. That's the point. All right? I want you to go back to Luke chapter 19 now. Now, notice what happens in verse 12. So were they right to look for the kingdom and say, Lord, restore it? Yes. But their timing was off because he had already said something. Watch. Luke chapter 19, verse 12. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman, that'll be him, went into a far country, that's heaven, to receive for himself a what? Kingdom, and then to do what? Return. See, he has to go away for a while to a far country, receive the kingdom, and then he's going to come back. In Acts chapter 1, when they ask the question, it is, it is later in that chapter that he does this. He goes into that far country, he ascends into the clouds of the angels, and then Daniel said he went into the ancient of days and received this kingdom. But there's some other stuff that needs to be done. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm believing Israel. And sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. I think that message was fulfilled when they stoned Stephen. Amen. Sent them said, we don't want that man to reign over us. So what is, what is, what is, what is, what is he going to do? Watch what he did right here. Verse 15. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the what? The kingdom. Then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much, and then it goes through all of that. But here's what I want you to see. Go down for time's sake. Verse 27. What about those who weren't his servants? What about the ones who said, ah, we do not want this man to reign over us? Verse 27. By the way, you ever notice when Stephen was stoned, he was saying words like these? Who are you to be ruler and judge over us? Same words. Verse 27. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither and do what? Slay them before me. What you see is a picture of that seven-year tribulation period that happens before the Lord returns. 
It's going to be, as Jeremiah 30 calls it, the time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah. There's that time of wrath. Remember, we were over in Matthew chapter 3. Go back there. You can leave Luke. Go back to Matthew 3. I, didn't, I purposely didn't read this verse because I want you to see. John didn't just say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said something else. We've got about 10 minutes. Thank you for your patience. I want to show you this. John says something in Matthew chapter 3. Look at verse 7. I stopped at verse 6 for a reason when they confessed them sins because there were some people who says, we're not having this man reign over us. And so John the Baptist, in his own way, he says, okay, watch this. Verse 7. But when he, that's John, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the unbelieving religious leaders of Israel, come to his baptism, he said unto them, O oh, generation of vipers. You think he was, John was a kind man, but he was honest. O oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the what to come? The wrath to come. Because when you talk about the kingdom program, you cannot separate these two things, the wrath from the kingdom. They're part and parcel. I would say they're two sides of the same coin. As well as, for our dispensation, the rapture and the what? The judgment seat of Christ. See, I was looking over the uh, right division chart again. Very nice tool. But now it's sta I can't even look at it because it stands out that when they have the rapture, they got thrones everywhere else, you know, the return of Christ, uh, the great white throne, all these things. Mm -hmm. A throne is missing until Brother Fernando put it on there. The rapture, it says the rapture, and then it says, you know, the body of Christ's main sphere of influence is the heavenly place. It's all true. Well, Brother Jordan didn't put that throne there. This is missing. The rapture is the vehicle that takes us to the judgment seat of Christ, part and parcel. When you talk about Israel's earthly kingdom, you have to talk about the wrath. They're, part, they're one and the same. Verse 7. Who hath warned you to... As John is preaching the kingdom, he's saying, there's the wrath to come. <clears throat> Peter believed that. Go over to Acts chapter 3. Go over to Acts chapter 3. Now the Holy Ghost is poured out. Peter believed that it was coming. Notice what he says. Look at Acts chapter number 3. Look at verse 19 and 20. Now I'm going to be knocking these out. We only got about uh, less than 10 minutes. I'm going to knock these out. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Acts 3, 19. Repent ye therefore, he, sell, he tells Israel, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Krista, can you close that door for me right there? Just close it. That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now what is he going to do? Verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. He's coming back. Verse 21, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, what? Since the world began. Hey, and he says, listen, all God's prophets have been talking about this. If you're going to understand the Bible, the entire Bible except 13 books, the entire Bible, except 13 books, is all about this right here. This kingdom on this earth. God has just been talking about it. When you talk about, I call this Prophecy Sunday. I said on the thing, I said, join us for live study in two hours for Prophecy Sunday. And when you talk prophecy, listen, when you talk prophecy, you know how I said the Lord means the righteous judge, you think that? Anytime you hear this word prophecy or the prophetic program, the prophetic program, prophecy, fake earthly kingdom. It equals the earthly kingdom. The whole Bible, except Paul's epistles, is all talking about that right there, the earthly kingdom. That's what they're talking about. How about later in Peter's ministry? Go over to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2. I'm getting all these on there, so y'all going to have to be patient. Because I, I want to have them all on there, so somebody can watch it. Okay? 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to go quickly through it, but 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9. Did Peter believe what God said in Exodus? Yes. But ye are a chosen 
generation. A royal priesthood. Peter is not talking about the body of Christ here. Amen. A royal priesthood. And holy nation. The exact same thing God said in Exodus. Yep. A peculiar people. Same thing, Exodus chapter 19. That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter didn't forget what God said. The Spirit of God wrote it through Peter. We're going to go to Revelation. Go to the end of the Bible. Go over to Revelation chapter 11. How about the end of the Bible? This is future now. Real quick. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. Everybody talk about the seven trumpets and the seven this and all this. Well, here's the end of all of it. Verse 15. Revelation eleven fifteen, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our what? Lord, and of his Christ, that's the Messiah, Jesus, and he, the Messiah, shall reign how long? Forever and ever. Is Jesus Christ reigning on this earth right now? The answer is no. But not just him. His people Israel are going to reign with them. Go over to chapter 20. Go over to chapter 20. These will be real quick. Revelation 20, verse 4 through 6. Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ, how long? A thousand years. A thousand years. But notice where it's at. Hold your hand there. Go back to chapter 5. That's the millennium. That's right. It's, it's, it's cycles. So where's this reign happening, though? On the what? There you go. Look at Revelation 5, verse 10. Revelation 5, verse 10. And has made us unto our God, what? kings and priests, kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on the earth. earth. Revelation finishes the prophetic program. Israel, the seed of Abraham, reigning where? On the earth. A couple more. Got to get them out there. Revelation 22. Revelation 22, 5. Revelation 22, 5. Revelation 22 and verse 5, and there shall be no light, uh, no night there in the kingdom. And they need no candle, neither light of sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign how long? Forever and ever. Forever and ever. Is Israel reigning over the earth forever and ever right now? No. These sayings are faithful and true. These sayings are faithful and true. Why the delay? Why the delay? Go back to 2 Peter 3. Go back to 2 Peter 3, and then we'll go to Paul and we'll end. 2 Peter 3. Peter, Peter tells Israel why there's a delay. 2 Peter 3, in the context of where's the promise of his coming, watch what Peter says in verse number 15. What's taking God so long, Apostle Peter? Israel asked their head apostle. Well, he's going to say, look at verse 15, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is what? Salvation. salvation. What salvation? Hold that thought. E what salvation? Hey, what salvation is God doing that is holding up the kingdom? There's somebody who knows about this salvation. Keep reading. Verse 15, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother who? Paul, also according to or in line with the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto what? <laughs> you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The thing that explains where the kingdom is, is the wisdom of God in a mystery. The mystery of Christ. Paul's Message is why God has held back the kingdom 
of, on this earth. Amen. The dispensation of grace given to the Apostle Paul is why the kingdom hasn't come. Brother Ryan, in 16 it says, as also... We're about to look at that. Let's look at it, Craig. I'm sorry. As also in all his epistles, all 13 of them. Mm -hmm. Now watch what happens when you have that Jewish mindset. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them, uh, of them of these things, in which, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and not established, unstable, what? Wrestle, wrestle with, wrestle. As they do also, as they do also the other scriptures to their what? Own destruction. Let me add something. To, if you're listening to them, to yours. Men who don't rightly divide and understand Paul, because you have to understand Paul before you understand the rest of scripture. But if you're going to understand anything outside of Paul, you got to understand what scripture is talking about, the earthly kingdom. And Peter says, if these fools don't listen to Paul, and they mix stuff up. They think they know stuff, but they don't. They're unstable. They're unlearned. They're going to be messed up. We got to end over here. Romans 11. Go to Romans 11. Romans 11. The wisdom of God in the mystery given to our apostle Paul is why the kingdom hasn't come yet. Romans chapter number 11. Look with me at verse 11. When Peter says that long suffering of God is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, have written unto you, it's this. You got it, Dodie? Romans 11. Look at verse 11. Romans 11, 11. When Israel was set aside in Acts 7, we will not have this man reign over us. What Paul said, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is com salvation. That's the salvation. Gentile grace salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Verse 25, Romans eleven twenty-five. 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. And you know why I call these fools fools? Is because when you think you know something about the Bible, but you don't know this and you don't understand Paul, you're wise in your own conceits. And the Bible says a fool Solomon says in Proverbs, a fool is wise in his own conceits. Here we go. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits. And what happened? God didn't replace Israel, and he didn't make us spiritual Israel. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my what? From the beginning. My covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel of grace, the un gospel of the uncircumcision, what? Uh, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But it's touching the election. They're beloved for whose sake? The Father's sake. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He never changed his mind. He may put it on hold, and he did. Let's end in Romans 16, 25. He put it on hold. He chose to do that. But the same God, the Father, who created the nation of Israel through Abraham, he had something already in mind, hid in himself, till he revealed it to the Apostle Paul. And that's this, Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, the gospel of grace, the gospel of the uncircumcision. And the preaching of Jesus Christ, not according to that which God made known out of the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began, like Peter says in Acts 3, according to the revelation of the what? Mystery. Do y'all understand that everything that God focuses on today is about the mystery of Christ? If you said, Brother Ron, what does God focus on today? What is his mind, his will, his affection? The mystery of Christ given to the Apostle Paul. That's it. All this other nonsense out there, let it go. In my years, I did what Paul is saying, that's where God's mind is. The preaching of his son, Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now it's been manifest. Listen, you want to you glorify God? People say all the time they want to glorify God, isn't it? 
tell people about this mystery of Christ, why this kingdom program. You make God, you, you're standing up for God the Father when you explain, look, fools, the Bible promised this kingdom. Don't try to explain it away, replace Israel, spiritual. It's, it is what it is. It just hasn't come because God's doing something else called the mystery of Christ. That's what you tell people. And God would be so pleased. What a local assembly is designed is to get that in you, to build it up in you, to test and try it. Say it again, Matthew. Pride and unbelief. Boom. What he said. Thank you all for your patience. I just wanted to get this because now here's a study that if you run into any replacement theologists, Calvinists, whatever, what's ever out there, this is the one form. Because this explains what the entire Bible has been setting up from the beginning and why it hasn't come true. It's not because God lied. It's not because he forgot that he didn't fulfill his promise or he replaced us, the, the Israel, with the body. It's because he's doing the mystery. He's doing something unique and distinct that he, in his glory, already had in his mind before the world began. And we got to give him glory. That's what I'm saying. That's glorious. And Satan wants to hide it because it's ordained before the world unto our glory and his glory. The, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. It's glorious. And when we stand up for the mystery and put it out there, we're saying to Satan and the world, here's the God of glory, the Lord of glory. Don't replace Israel with the body, no. Say Israel is Israel and we're we and today what God is doing is us and that's what we need to magnify, the mystery of Christ. And it starts with salvation. God has sent his son to die on that cruel and criminal Roman cross, get touched by those heathen Gentiles, uncircumcised nasty dogs and spit on them because he loves us, he loves us. I said to Krista, if Jada Lynn ever wanna know if mama loved her, there's two witnesses in our house, and they both go, meow. Because <laughs> that house smells like cat now. Yeah. I woke up today, I was all my, guess what a kitty litter is in my, in my sink, <laughs> under my sink. I got to walk through kitty litter to get dressed, you know. And I tell Jada Lynn, if you want to know mama's love, it's because you got these cats. My woman does not want no cats. Well, if you want to know God's love, look at that cross. Look at that cruel and criminal Roman cross that our Lord died on. But he didn't stay on that cross like the Catholics. He came off that cross and he rose to dead. But his blood paid your sin debt. Don't you believe me? And if you're saved today, you need to be in the mystery of Christ. That's what glorifies God. I'm not saying that we replace Israel, we spiritual Israel, we think you're Israel in the four gospels. No, I just went through this. I challenge anybody, listen to this, listen to it three times. Then I'll invite you to the assembly and we'll record and you poke the holes in it from scripture. I'm up. We're open for it. You ain't gonna be able to do it though. It's gonna be crickets. <laughs> I was on for three hours on a radio show in Minnesota calling up, having the atheists. The, the day before, the, the regular host got all these atheists calling because the day I was on, I, I, I opened the phone line for the atheists. Nobody called. They called the next day when I wasn't on. <laughs> I wanted them because I wanted to talk about the scripture. Crickets, the way Brother Jim spelled crickets. C-R-I-Q-U-E-T-S, crickets, that's Brother Jim. <laughs> but anyway. Is that like the game cricket? He mixed, he mixed, he mixed it up. <laughs> you know how when you say people give you crickets when you ask them something they can't answer? <laughs> he mixed up the game cricket with crickets. Anyway, <laughs> well don't, 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 don't be, don't be a, uh, like Matthew said, don't have pride and unbelief. Believe the mystery, be part of that. And that pleases God, and it'll give you reward at that judgment seat of Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time this morning. We thank you for your Holy Scripture, Father. You, a man cannot have any power, true power, without the Holy Spirit and the Holy Word of God. That's what true power is. You could be penniless in this world, but have God's power through the mighty Holy Scriptures and your Holy Spirit in them. So, Father, I thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit by faith alone, in Christ alone. And then you have built Christ in us, or you, you have the process of building Christ in us through the word of Christ, through Paul, and the entire scripture rightly divided. We can understand these things, and as Dodie always say, how does people not see this? Well, because they don't understand the message of Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. But when you believe Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, all these other things 
God, the Lord give you understanding in all things because you listen to Paul. So we thank you, Father, for this time together. As we take our break and have our Q&A, we ask you to bless that time as well. We think about our brothers and sisters in Christ who aren't with us today in the flesh and those who follow our way of the Internet from afar. May your grace and mercy bless them this beautiful day as well. We thank you for all this in Christ's name.